Welcome to the Sustainable Dish Podcast. I'm Diana Rogers, a real food registered dietitian, author, and sustainability advocate. I co-host this podcast with James Connolly, who was a producer on my film, Sacred Cow. I also founded the Global Food Justice Alliance, an initiative advocating for the inclusion of animal source foods like meat, dairy, and eggs for a more nutritious, sustainable, and equitable worldwide food system. You can check it out and join me at globalfoodjustice.org. Thanks again for listening, and now on to our show. Today's podcast is sponsored by Paleo Valley, makers of one of my favorite supplements, the Organ Complex. It contains all of the benefits of liver, heart, and kidney to those of us who don't really love eating those ancestral foods because of the taste. The nutrients are helpful for brain health, hair, skin and nails, and also for energy. Get 15% off with my link, sustainabledish.com backslash PV15. That's sustainabledish.com backslash PV15. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. I'm so excited to have Chelsea and Tosh from Well for Culture. They have this beautiful book, The Seven Circles, Indigenous Teachings for Living Well. Um, Welcome to the podcast, guys. I learned about you through a post that you did on social media about um, that related directly to the stuff I was talking about in Sacred Cow with, um, and we even, Rob and I talked about it in the book about um, how insulting the idea that, you know, um, someone is spiritually cleansed if they're not eating meat and how insulting that is to, to first yeah. nations people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, uh, I really appreciated your post about the bison, um, and got to know a little bit more about your work and we're finally chatting. It's been a little while. So, um, please introduce yourselves and, and talk a little bit about how you got into this. All right. I'll go first. Tom Madakiapi. Hello, relatives. Hello, everyone out there listening. Um, it's really great to be here today. My name is Chelsea Luger, and I am an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, which is a tribal nation up in north central North Dakota, where I grew up. I'm also from the Cheyenne River and Standing Rock Sioux tribes. And um, I'm now coming to you from my home in Tempe, Arizona, which is Autumn Territory, where I live here with uh, my husband, Thosh. And as you mentioned, we're the co-authors of The Seven Circles, and um, we are wellness advocates, and most of the work that we do is within Indigenous communities. Yeah, it's good, Dosh, friends, family. Anya Chigik Dosh Collins. I'm from the Anakamere Autumn people, the Salt River people. On my paternal side and my maternal side is uh, Wajaji Haudenosaunee from Oklahoma, and I was born and raised in my father's community in Salt River, right outside of what is now known as Phoenix, Arizona. And like Chelsea said, I live together with her just outside of our reservation with our two daughters, Weston and Allo. And we are in the process of building our home on the reservation in the community. So, and and so right now we're living in town, but uh, we started our work together. uh, Well, for culture, we started working on this in like 2013 and 2014. And we started traveling the United States and all over first nations communities in Canada and, and, and doing um, indigenous uh, um, health and wellness uh, educating. So we're, you know, look at ourselves as indigenous uh, community health educators. And a lot of the things that we're talking about, the things that we write about in the book is, is really based upon our, our respective teachings that we learned from elders, knowledge keepers, uh, you know, firsthand experience in, in our communities and just um, really taking, taking in oral tradition and what the history says amongst our people about how to live a good way of life. And in, in the recent recent years here we we have been keeping our our ears to the ground about what's happening in in science and medicine and looking at the various scientific evidence that comes out that is coincides with what we know to be true is indigenous peoples and so we are we are advocates of the marrying of both scientific knowledge and information recent evidence and indigenous ways of knowing and being. So we are huge advocates of putting these together. And that's why we enjoy your work, uh, the work of your colleague, Rob Wolf, and many others that are associated in your circle. Mm-hmm. And um, so thanks, you know, thank you for having us on the podcast. And uh, you, we look forward to, to sharing and talking. Yeah, um, there's so many parts of your book that I loved. And I, especially the introduction just really sums up so much of your worldview, which 
um, I relate to so much. Um, and right in the beginning, you talk about how your world or the way you approach wellness is not purely anything Mm -hmm. that it's a, it's a, you're not anti-science. You're not, you're, you're kind of just combining all the best of all of the things. Yeah. Um, and I really love that because it's so, there's so many things that you share with sustainability and regenerative ag and, and where I'm looking at wellness from. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, another thing that you, that you talked about, uh, right on the next page is that you both kind of came to this, because of some some struggles that you had uh, yep. Yep. growing up. And I think that mm-hmm. that's something that a lot of people, us mortal people, when we see gorgeous fit uh, folks like you <laughs> who, are, who are out there with like you know, beautiful bodies doing these movements that I don't know <laughs> that I could even do anymore. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you kind of, there's a uh, assumption that, that you've always looked like this, that you've always, uh, you know, this is just something that, you know, you were sort of gifted and there's, and it's unattainable for, uh, us regular people. Um, and, but you talked about, you know, that you had a lot of challenges and where you're at today is not despite them, it's because of them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, Dosh and I, we, we always like to start by saying that the reservations that we come from are beautiful, rich dynamic wonderful places spiritually wealthy places and a lot of the stereotypes that you see about native american culture and life in mainstream media are totally um absent of that side of our narrative as indigenous people so part of our work is we really like to show how not only we but many people from our communities defy or live differently from the negative side of those stereotypes. Um, But at the same time, we're not sugarcoating anything like, yes, of course, we are facing immense struggles in our communities. And even though Dosh and I are, we, we, we don't actually really share too much about our personal lives or personal struggles, because we don't want to be gratuitously sharing those things, like Mm -hmm. sharing it for likes or for sympathy or something like that and then also we acknowledge a lot of the struggles that we've been through involve our family members and Mm -hmm. it's not our place to share personal information from family and community so all that is to say to be honest with you we have we're not immune from those struggles even though we don't highlight that or talk about it Mm -hmm. all the time we've both been through a lot of things and a lot of struggles um that uh, have been, uh, you know, a part of just the struggles that our communities face post-colonially. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it's our spirituality and our culture and the teachings of our people that have allowed us to emerge from many of those struggles or to face them today with a sense of resilience and a sense of strength. And um, so it's not despite our culture or despite our struggles, but it's because of um of our culture that we've been able to you know uh, ultimately live uh, a fairly well and mm-hmm. balanced lifestyle that that we could say we're living today and and we're very very grateful for that and we don't take it for granted and we don't think that we're finished you know mm-hmm. i could wake up tomorrow and fall completely off of this path mm-hmm. but that's why i have to wake up every day with the conviction i'm going to keep keep working at mm-hmm. this I like that you asked that question, Diana, too, because a a lot of people sort of assume that about us when we are either on social media or maybe we travel to certain communities and, you know, people will might make a comment or speak at a tone like, well, it's easy for you or it must be nice. They said that about us before we had kids, right? And then oh, now that we really? Have kids... For sure before we had kids, yeah. <laughs> now that... they're like, we trust you a little bit because you got kids. <laughs> yeah. but, but like we write in the book, and Chelsea wrote this part in the book where she said we both narrowly escaped addiction and looking at, you know, our history and our communities and, you know, it's, it's generally – known of course and 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 should be known more by those that don't that indigenous communities today are still are still healing from the persisting impacts of colonialism and some people and most people in dominant society when they hear colonialism they think hundreds of years ago it's it's really a concept that seems to be sort of erased from the the dominant society narrative right now but it's it's used much within the indigenous community in this in this movement to reclaim our identity, reclaim our, our original life ways, 
and to be able to create a good life you know, is the norm once again for future generations. But yes, both of us, you know, had have had our struggles, you know, with, with alcohol, substances, unhealthy relationships, unhealthy circles of people. And like Chelsea said, but simultaneously, we were raised in certain traditions, really uh, raised in community. And it was those that gave us the tools mm -hmm. to overcome when we did get these obstacles. Both of us were you know, born and raised uh, on a reservation and around it. And then both of us, you know, left to, to live in major cities. She went to New York City. She went to, uh, she went to, to Dartmouth on the East Coast. And she went to Columbia, New York City. I went to San Francisco, artist to San Francisco. I lived down in Los Angeles. And that's where we, we really experienced a lot of, you know, the bulk of our, of our challenges, um, of course, in childhood as well. But it was our teachings. It was the cultural teachings. And, and somehow we were able to able to muster up that much strength to to get back on on walking a good path as they say in our communities we are walking a red road and you know walking in a good way with the good heart the good mind and following the, the teachings that our ancestors <clears throat> have laid out so you know i like that you asked that because that's certainly you know how we are and like chelsea said you know we always share with our own people there's no finish line to health and wellness in this journey and and there's never a point where all of a sudden yeah i'm healed I'm, i can do whatever i want you know i can drink again or i can you know eat this or do that again i don't have to work out ever again because i'm at this you know level of my fitness it's never that way right it's we are constantly on this journey and there's constantly obstacles in our path and it's about having the tools to be able to overcome those obstacles and navigate a really complex world a world that seems to clash with all of our values as human beings of a world that is a complete mismatch to our genes as human beings. I think that's what living a good way of life is health and wellness is having the tools mm -hmm. to overcome that and to be able to maintain your humanness in this world. And that is so uh, polarizing and extreme as it is today and, and toxic in, in many ways, it's environmentally and, you know, social, politically, uh, social narratives, it's about maintaining nuance and maintaining a, 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 a strong presence and being able to move forward, you know, like an arrow cuts through the, through, through the air, move forward and you're, you're, you're steadfast and you have your vision and you continue on regardless of what's in the path. To me, I think that's what health and wellness is really about. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's why your work resonated with me so much. And, um, you know, there was something that uh, that Rob said one time in one of his his talks that I kind of stole, and that was like, if you're not sick and uh, and overweight and and suffering, then you're kind of not doing American right, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so that goes. I mean, it's so wonderful that you're able to um, pull on your uh, indigenous heritage, and I think that might be part of the reason why we have so many lost people in America today mm -hmm. um, because there's, there's no heritage to pull from for mm -hmm. any of them. Yeah. Um, and mainstream society is just so uh, toxic. The food environment is toxic. The work environments are toxic. Mm -hmm. It's all about taking and taking and, um, and, and this concept, I know I, we, we had talked uh, briefly about uh, the book Ishmael, but like the, the giver, the leavers and takers, which I know is um, integral to, um, to the, the worldview of your book as well. So, um, so again, just like kudos for bringing this all together in a really holistic way, because that's how I approach things. And, um, and I know we, we had talked also about wellness culture right mm -hmm. yeah. today and how it has been so reduced to this vanity thing. And I think, um, you know, that partly can feel alienated to alienating to some people who are trying to do better because they see fitness influencers and they, you know, they look so unattainable. Right. Um, mm -hmm. but by you bringing in all these other aspects and talking about, um, you know, there might be some points in your life where movement just is not, the biggest priority for you and mm -hmm. that's okay. So mm -hmm. will you talk about like how this, this beautiful like organism of health and spirituality and, and, and wellness can kind of morph depending on where you're at? Mm -hmm. Circles and yeah. Out. So th the model that we used to, that we have been using to teach for a long time that we created uh, as a result of learning how to teach about wellness when we've traveled all around native country, we call it the seven circles of wellness, and it includes food, movement, sleep, 
sacred space, which is your home, community, land, and ceremony. ceremony. So uh, those are seven areas of life that we believe our ancestors thrived in, and those are seven areas that remain relevant for health today, no matter who you are and where you come where you come from. And um, so the reason that we initially organized it into circles as opposed to anything else is because everything we saw in health before was pillars, separate pillars, separate categories, this department here, this, uh, this wing over there, everything compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that all of these areas, in fact, are interconnected and, um, and overlap and, and, uh, to answer your question about, um, how do we apply this to our daily life? Well, it starts by acknowledging that at any given day, you're going to wake up really strong in some of those areas and you're going to wake up feeling like um, you, having neglected other areas. And we can't do them all every day. We can't be perfect in all of them in equal measure every single day. But that model is always there as something for you to visualize and return to. So for me, like I wake up today, uh, my sleep hasn't been the best. Um, but I know it'll get there. I have a two year old who sleeps with me and, you know, kicks me in the stomach all night. And, you know, rather than just beating myself up and saying like, oh, I'm so bad at this. I'm never going to have the perfect circadian rhythm. Uh, because I know that it's a model I can return to, I say to myself, I'm, I'm just more patient with myself. And there that contributes to my wellness and my mental health and my mental wellness, as opposed to just making me feel like some kind of a failure. Um, movement, you know, uh, gosh, I have to tease myself because my Instagram name is Chelsea moves, but it's more like Chelsea moves, uh, for about five days and then forgets to move for another three weeks and then gets back to it, you know? Um, but that's the truth. And uh, when I was in my early twenties following bodybuilding culture, I would have felt like a complete failure and really beating myself up and making me f myself feel bad if I missed a workout. But now, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? No, it's okay if I fall off for a little while. Life happens. And um, the important thing is I maintain and I get back to it and I maintain that determination when I can. So yes, like every day, some of these circles will grow, some will shrink, different phases of life. Some of these circles will be much more prevalent and thriving while others will be neglected. But we gotta just keep returning when we can and keep those wheels in motion. And and to add, you know, back to the model, the circles is that is that all those seven circles are are life ways, right? Those are things that that we do. Mm -hmm. And what areas those affect is us as a whole, a spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional mm -hmm. well being. That's that's what we are made up of, and a lot of indigenous people recognize that. So those life ways are affecting that connection to land. You know, you zoom into that. And what does that mean? That really, that really means that everything we do as human beings evolved on the land, mm -hmm. right? At some point, everything evolved in the land. Teachings come from the land. We learned how to eat from the land. We learned how to build shelter and all that from the land there. The land is the curator of our cultures. But as we know, since, since industrialization, there's been a disconnect from that. And there's, there's been a disconnect between the people and their connection to the land. And emerged out of that was this concept of nature. Nature is something separate from you. It's different than you. You're you're not a part of it, and and it's something to conquer. It's something to to break down and 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 and, and to control and create this commodity. You know, or create some sort of a deed out of it. You know, and um, so if we look at connection to land, it's the original, and it it it's sort of interconnected to all these other circles, such as you look at food ways, getting out on the land to hunt, to forage, to, to plant seeds. Um, you're doing this stuff with community, with people. You did this in, in units, and we still do this today in, in units and in, 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 in you know family uh, family structure, social structure. <clears throat> so that's that that component of the circle of of connection to community, right? Because community is made up of you, family, your community that you live around, and those that you're connected to at large in a greater world at large. So it it brings all that together, and. It's also on the land is you, you do things such as movement. You know, we have we have uh, gatherings on the land. We have maybe a ceremonial thing or maybe somebody goes out to meditate or they go out to do mindfulness or they go out to do uh, intentional breathing, you know, out on the land. There's so many different, you know, components that that of this that are inextricably connected. They're all so, sort of interrelated. And that's what we try to 
communicate in the book and with our model to everybody and outside of our culture. And the reason, you know, we had shared this was because we as native people are watching, we're partaking in dominant culture, but we're also seeing it. We're watching it from sort of almost this outside perspective. You know, I watch the news, I watch what's happening in social media and many indigenous people have commented on this. All of our cultural leaders in history have commented peeking into dominant culture and try to offer. And, and some say, you know, we have pity upon them because they're, they don't know they've lost their way, which is what you alluded to earlier. So the book is really a, a, a way in offering it's our offering is, is just really to native people. Like we say in the book, we can't speak for all indigenous people, you know, or even for our communities, but really just as a family, we tried to share this very basic model, a basic template to returning to your human ways. And that's really what indigenous culture is. It's just returning to our original human ways, the ways that we have, that have allowed us to evolve and thrive and survive, you know, over a million years on the lands that we are all on today. Mm -hmm. So that's why we created it that, that, in that, that circular format. But do you want to speak to even how this, this sort of vanity you know, component might Yeah, share? please do. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, the thing is that wellness has become an industry. We all know that. It's, um, I think there's real wellness and then there's the industry of wellness. And um, in and the, the vanity of wellness and the, yeah. and the <laughs> Instagramming yeah. ice baths and things like that, right? Yeah. Vanity yeah. cannot be removed from the industry. And we try our best to uh, acknowledge when that, and to recognize that aspect. And that's... Uh, you know, just like the healthcare industry, it relies upon people being sick and desperate in many cases. And so that's why you'll never see Thosh or I pitching products that we don't believe in or anything like that. And really just um, trying to uh, be aware of that commercialized aspect and how a lot of people are being sold products and ideas that uh aren't going to benefit them in the long run. And so, um, so we just hope that folks, when they read our book, they're not feeling like they have to run to the store, buy something new, buy, you know, 20 ingredients from all around the world to make a smoothie and, um, you know, supplements and this and that, like, we really just hope that folks are able to uh, look at wellness uh, in, in this true sense of seeking balance and to be able to look at food ways in a much more practical sense, once again, to do the best with what we have in this, you know, very challenging time and to, to, for folks to be easy on themselves is really yeah. what we're hoping for. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we encourage everyone to have a critical mind when they are learning things about how to live a good a good life mm -hmm. and we encourage critical thought and encourage people to try to put on their nuance lens and look at how all these certain aspects of the the mainstream wellness uh scene how these may be needed at certain times more than other and and how these are not not the end all be all solution like you know we see a, like you said we see a lot of we see a, the cold plunge fad that's happening. And many of us have been doing that for a long time. And I write about that in the book before I, I realized this was a huge fad. We've written about how our men's society, our men's circle would, would, would run us young men through that at an early age, at, mm -hmm. at, at going into the river during the wintertime at sunrise when we are freezing and shaking. And they told us it was going to improve. It was going to make our skin harder. It was going to improve our grit. You know, and when I learn later on that, yes, it did improve my grit at a young age. It changed your nervous system. It gives you tools. It gives you a little bit of resiliency as well. Um, but that's just one component. There's so many components to, to living a good way of life on the land there. So we encourage people to be careful about jumping all in in, in, in much of these fads that we are seeing and to, to look at, you know, how, when these are needed and, and that these are just all components to the larger picture. And it's important for people to, you know, uh, not look at one person or one practice or one food as the end all be all, because that's what we see as native Americans. I've seen into dominant culture. There's always this emphasis on one, you know, one man, one place, one food, you know, mm -hmm. there's this concept and it comes from, I guess, religious ideology and it made its way into dominant society's collective consciousness. So people are sort of, um, 
they're sort of uh, trained to see one person is going to lead them, you know, or one food is going to save them, you know, or, or one type, one organ, uh, you know, of, of, of meat eating or something like that, or one uh, sort of uh, super plant food is the solution to end all. And it just isn't that way. One There's, style of exercise. Yes. Yeah. One style of exercise. You know what I mean? Um, you Capitalism. Know, People are trying to sell you something. That's ex why. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's the marrying of a capitalistic mindset in this, this, this concept of the one end all be all thing. And we like to just remind people that nothing in our world is dependent upon just one thing. And, 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 and how you can look at the true roots of it is that if you look at the aspects that allow us to live, it's air. It's the sunlight right here. It's the earth beneath us. It's the microorganisms in the soil. It's the microorganisms and the animals that live on them. It's the animal's role yeah. on the land. It's our role. And if you look at us, if you go into us, you'll see that liver, heart, brain, all these things, the nervous system, the enteric nervous system, you know, the, the, the endocrine system, all these things work in, in, in together. They work together and then they're inextricably connected. They're whole. And that everything in this world is dependent upon one another. And so we must acknowledge the whole of everything and how it works. I think that people can understand that by understanding the basics. Once again, it's just like that in functioning community, functioning society. There's many different things. So we like to encourage people to be careful of, of really jumping on with these fads and, and, and just seeing them for the vanity component to it. But looking at what's the functionality of this? Is this right for me? You know? Or, or for you in, in a certain time of life, right? Like if you're, if you're up all night with a two-year-old kicking you in the stomach, <laughs> jumping into a cold plunge first thing in the morning not what you think might that. not be what your nervous system needs right now, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and I think the older I get, the, the more nuance I see with, with wellness. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just dive into these different circles at different times. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And it's something that I've been you know, in, intuitively incorporating in my life. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I'm not right now in my life is not the time for a cold plunge. It's just not. And yeah. I feel good about that. And I don't need to, um, be, you know, telling yeah. other people that it's going to solve all their problems. And it's, it's so funny because I think again, when the, when the ancestral health paleo movement first started, it was a very holistic, you know, yeah. these are, uh, these are the ideas. And then it got reduced to ultra processed paleo foods that yeah. were making yeah. people lots of money and, and good for them. But, uh, but it, it just got reduced to, yeah. um, you know, these special goji berries or mm -hmm. acai bowls are going right. to save you. Right. Yeah. Um, and we can, mm -hmm. I, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier before we got on too with even regenerative agriculture, you know, started as a as concept that that came from a very kind of sacred worldview of yeah. wanting to improve the land. And now it's like, how can we trademark this? How can we profit on this idea? How can and I think that's where the the plant based um, industry has really, you know, like, how can I capitalize on sustainability? Yeah. How can I how can I make money on this idea that people are feeling uncomfortable with where the world is at right now and mm -hmm. how can I sell them this promise um in a six dollar package of vegan yeah no death meat right mm -hmm. yeah yep absolutely. yeah and, and again that's where the critical thought component comes in you know people we encourage people really need to look at what's being fed to them whether it be a narrative or a product and look at is this sustainable for the long run do I need this mm -hmm. is this congruent with my budget you know, is it sustainable for me to continue to order this or subscribe to this over Amazon over the next 15, 20 years? You know, can I do without this? Am I going to be dependent upon another product? How many products are we already dependent upon as human beings? We're largely dependent upon so many different things. And, you know, is another product, you know, really something that's that we need, I think. And I, we try to encourage that. Yeah. Um, I And I think another reason that Dosh and I are both uh, so confident in, um, in how we teach about wellness and how we view wellness is sort of in this more broad sense that is mindful of these trends and the, and the packaging of different ideologies, the greenwashing, so on and so forth is because, um, not only have we researched ancestral science as indigenous science as well as western science um not researched is the wrong word we're not researchers we're not in the lab doing the science but 
you know, we looked you. into all of these things and read the studies and so on and so forth. But, um, but also we've experimented when we were not, not so much anymore, but when we were both first getting into the wellness world in our, uh, you know, early mid twenties and trying, I think I, I did experiment with plant-based and completely gluten-free and completely dairy-free and, you know, kind of did these little trial periods with um, trying to understand a lot of these different fads and seeing how it made my body feel and seeing whether or not it was actually um, sustainable for me in my lifestyle, particularly when I was living up in North Dakota. And um, <laughs> nine times, nine and a half times out of 10, wasn't working for me, you know? And, and uh, what a relief, because ultimately I've come to a place where wellness has gotten a lot easier for me and a lot more manageable to maintain because I don't have to be so extreme about it the way that so many people are pitching. And I remember, you know, I, I, this is why I just really appreciate the work that you do because, um, folks like you have, um, brought it back to the, you know, brought, brought back the idea to the conversation that, you know, things like red meat have been so demonized and so, you know, misconstrued and misunderstood by a lot of these health influencers. And, um, and that remains an issue today. And when, and I just remember when I, um, I feel like in the bottom, you know, in the back of my mind, I always knew that that can't be right. Yeah. I'm a Lakota person. My people survived off of bison meat for hundreds, thousands of years. There, there's no way it can be so bad. I also grew up on a cattle ranch and, you know, uh, I saw a lot of healthy people eating red meat all the time. You know, you should see my uncle. He's a pushing 80, 80 something you yeah. know he's he's in his late 70s and he's like one of the most in shape 70 something year olds i've ever seen and this guy eats steak every single day of his life you know so um yeah i i, I just i it was such a relief to me to see people like you like you know yeah. sort of bringing this knowledge back that no 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 meat is not the enemy and when we look at it as the enemy this is why and um when we uh when i learned that it became so much easier for me to um, to teach and share about wellness in my communities once again. Yeah. And this is why this is a social justice issue. When we demonize meat, we're uh, completely neglecting a huge portion of the indigenous population who cannot fathom a life without it. Because it's true that when our when buffalo hunting went away, Cattle replace that as a nutritional source, as a source of nutrition that people are comfortable with in my communities. I cannot go to North Dakota to a reservation and tell people to eat plant-based. I will get laughed off. And if I do tell them that, then it's going to be really hard for me to point them toward, you know, these different beans and legumes and all this stuff to find in the grocery store. It's just not happening. So this is a social justice issue for me, and um, and it's a cultural issue, and it, it's it's really an injustice to demonize meat in the way that in the way that people have. Chelsea speaks often to you know the 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 proponents, um, excuse me, the opponents of of meat eating and how they they advocate for you know the rights of animals, which of course we have reverence for all living beings, but there's nuance there, you know which I'll talk about a little bit later on. So she speaks to that, but their, their lack of, <clears throat> excuse me, but their lack of, of compassion for the loss of indigenous people on these, these plains, these, these, these lands that we now call America who have been removed, you know, to, to do things such as create, not just of course, industrial ag, but plant foods and such. So share about that. I like how you get into that. Oh, well, yeah, I just think, you know, whenever I hear a, a sort of a, an extreme uh, vegan or plant-based argument about um, the way that, you know, ranching and meat production is harming the environment, um, I, never, um, I never hear them talk about colonialism. I never hear them talk about the history of, um, you know, the, the destruction of the grasslands, which were you know, uh, some of the most biodiverse territory in, in, uh, around the world. And, um, and I never hear them talk about any sort of initiatives to, um, reclaim 
some of those wild grasslands to reclaim bison herds that experienced uh, a literal genocide. Um, and which affected you the know, health of the people. Bottom line is, if if you the only way that that's ever going to happen is if people are interested in in eating and those uh, eating that meat again and maintaining those herds. And um, it's you know to me that that brings animals back to life it brings habitat back to life um i would love to hear more sort of vegan and plant-based arguments that acknowledge that history Mm -hmm. right because it's they're largely absent from the social justice component of indigenous Mm -hmm. people whose you know whose whose lives have been directly affected as you know as well Mm -hmm. so we kind of see that and that's also one of our our criticisms of the the plant-based narrative um, that mm-hmm. that attempts to, I guess, infiltrate too with a native country, and then there are some native people who have been um, who the plant based narrative has infiltrated their mind because just because of many different indigenous peoples, we in pre colonial times we farmed most notably corns, bean, and squash all the way from you know what is now known as Central America all the way to the northeastern part of Canada. Indigenous people have farmed and corn in English terms across the board is sort of regarded as the mother because it united all these people and corn was prepared many different ways. And of course, we're talking about heirloom corn, thousands of varieties, not the standard um, sweet corn that you see throughout, you know, the, the, the Midwestern portion of America, um, which is not even really used for eating most of it, um, chemicals and such, you know, but, um, you know, so oftentimes people will get caught up in the, the narrative and they're over embellish in this idea that their people ate mostly plant and didn't eat meat. And there's some that will go as far as saying that, that, you know, eating meat was frowned upon in certain nations with, you know, and, and to me, again, it's a really over embellishment and they're also being misled. Our people are also susceptible to being misled by these mainstream narratives. But if you look all across native country and I've been traveling various reservations for 20 years now, over 20 years since I was a youth and with a youth group that traveled all over the United States to, to various gatherings and different communities to connect with other communities. And never have I heard an elder or knowledge keeper say that their people didn't eat meat. Never have I met a very powerful spiritual person, a healer who I've seen work with my own eyes say they don't eat meat. So that way they can be spiritually enlightened. That's just not a narrative that's that exists in native country in which you spoke to it, you know, in the beginning saying that those narratives are sort of a slap in the face to indigenous people to say, you know, how can we survive the, the millions of thousands of years on this, this land here? How can we survive and, and be free of things such as cancer, colon cancer, to be free of type two diabetes, all metabolic health disorders, neurodegenerative disorders? How can we exist and be free of all those, but eat meat in the way that we did to eat fat from, from, from salmon and, and, and walleye and, and bison, you know, um, caribou and such, how can we eat that much fat and meat and, and be in good health? And, and, you know, so we look at various regions of the, of the country and I always share with native people, instead of jumping on with the fad diets, look at the modalities in which your people had acquired their food. In most places they acquired by, by, by hunting, Fishing is one. Another one, another region, we grew, we grew food, we planted seeds pre-colonial times, we foraged seasonally, and we traded, and we always cooked. And no matter what they were eating, they gave thanks. They always had gratitude at the forefront of the mind, they gave thanks. And we encourage people to bring those into your daily habits again, bring those into your daily you know, uh, ways of acquiring food in addition to the grocery store, and being a conscious consumer and staying on the perimeter. And these are such critical things. So I tell people a better method is instead of jumping on with a fad diet, look at how did the ways did you did your ancestors acquire the food? How do you mimic that in a contemporary setting? How do you incorporate fasting in between meals just like our people did? And they did that not because of, you know, autophagy or whatever. They did that because, you know, it was it was their survival had depended upon it because they would ration, they had to ration food. And so we I tell people today, you know, obviously we're in the age of plenty, we're 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 living in a, a time where the, you have an abundance of food of high calorie but l- low nutrients. And you're consuming, and we're consuming all day long, and the blood sugar is up and down. Insulin is always out until we start to experience hyper, you know, hy- hyperglycemia leading on to insulin resistance to full-on type 2 diabetes, which puts us at risk of, of all the metabolic disorders. Like, 
this is the reason why. It's not because we're eating meat. It's because the environments that we're living in are a complete mismatch to our genes. You know, and so that's what we a big thing that we like to, to share with people is look at those methods of acquiring food. How do you apply that today with regard to your budget, mm-hmm. access, your specific nutritional needs? Such critical things to think about, I think, that goes beyond following a diet based on ideology. Oh, yeah. Gosh, there's so much you just said that um, that resonated with me. I don't know. Did I share with you the um, the food igloo that I saw come out of Canada? No, um, that's really cool. Oh my! Well, it sounds cool. Not. If if there could ever be an image that would that would fully represent like colonial oh, imperialism, cultural Im- imperialism okay. on food ways, it would be this. So it was oh, these Canadian dietitians came up with um a. a uh, for the Inuit, a, yeah. a food igloo. Oh no! Putting all of their traditional uh, food that they would hunt at the top in red. So oh. all the, the goose and, 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 um, and all the other foods that, that they would hunt. Yeah. And then at the bottom was orange juice, cereal. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Like the Mediterranean diet type foods. It's unbelievable. I'll it's- make sure it gets in the show notes. Um, and I'll yeah. send you, I'll email you guys a copy of this. We put it in mm-hmm. sacred cow because it's just abominable. Um, yeah. My reaction at first was positive because in certain cases I've seen uh, indigenous kind of um, food sovereignty advocates creating these, you know, using that model of like, you know, some sort of an indigenous symbol and then actually making a good, you know, iteration of the food pyramid. But, um, but yeah, I've, I've also seen that. So it's too bad that they, that they did that. Mm -hmm. And, and man, the Inuit of all people, man, they're, they're, they're diet and, and the way that they've managed to maintain their their hunting traditions and their is is incredible, you know, mm-hmm. and and a model to be learned from. Looking at their traditional food ways and the lifestyle associated with it, um, and just a resilient people and you know brilliant food ways. But yeah, that's it's really unfortunate. Yeah, and you know, genetically, uh, um, sugar um, absorption or sugar breakdown um, yeah. for a lot of them is is a real challenge. And mm-hmm. so, yeah. um, you know, to give them a high carbohydrate recommendation, just assuming you know that Mediterranean diet works for everybody, oh, was, yeah. was, you know. Yeah. And on the flip side, I've also seen some um, in the in the agriculture community. Um, you know, promoting this like African heritage type diet, mm. which, um, you know, is, is very low in meat and high in, in beans. And, um, you know, I, I also kind of question that as a dietitian and someone who has studied, um, you know, very traditional cultures, because, you know, there's a reason why meat was restricted. It's not, it's not that that necessarily works best for an African, um, uh, uh, human, you know, it's, it's that, you know, meat was restricted to slaves. Mm -hmm. And so they had to do what they could do with, um, the scraps and things like that. And that's Mm why, um, you see the South, uh, so high in, in, um, foods that could travel well, like fried chicken. Um, Mm -hmm. but also, you know, um, just like the food scraps instead of like the, the, the cuts that were sort of saved Mm -hmm. for, Right, you know mm-hmm. the landowners and things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I hear those two, it's it's hard to believe because for me as a hunter, like anytime I peek into even just a documentary on about like the those those tribes and nations in Africa and and, and the way they hunt, and it's mm-hmm. you know to me it's 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 humbling to watch what they're able to do, you know, with and with the technology that they have and they keep it that way, you know, the way they the way they hunt, <laughs> you know, in groups um, with spears and such, and looking at you know these people revered they revered they revered you know hunting still to this day you know yeah it's you know it's it's really interesting and i think you know we definitely observe and we feel a solidarity with uh gosh people all over the world who have experienced colonialism and who are trying to maintain and reclaim food ways and to understand what that is uh you know in our own individual circumstances it it really is hard it really is challenging and i guess that's just what's so upsetting about a lot of these fad diets is it just doesn't make it doesn't make it any easier for any of us you know no matter who we are Mm -hmm. and where we come from but um yeah yeah um so 
Well, let's just touch a little bit on some of these other um, circles before we go, um, because we did touch, we, we yeah. covered a lot of territory that I was, I was hoping to, which Good. I'm really uh, glad about. Yeah. Um, but one that I haven't really um, been very successful with. So you've got food, sleep, movement, ceremony, mm -hmm. sacred space, land, and community. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the ceremony piece. Can you talk Ooh. a little bit more about that? Because that's... Um, I know for myself, that's an area that I yeah. could grow in. So I'll start by saying this was the hardest chapter in the book for us to write, knowing that there are a huge community of new agers and sort of uh, creepy cultural appropriators out there who are literally um, trying to, you know, steal like sacred indigenous ceremonies and to, uh, you know, profit off of them and sell them and package them and all that kind of stuff. And, we just want to start by, we always have to start by saying we are not advocating for that kind of stuff, you know, for tech bros traveling to the Amazon to, to do ayahuasca in a completely out of context, you know, scenario. Like we don't advocate for any of that stuff at all. Mm -hmm. um, however, we maintain throughout this and we discuss this with our publisher we're, you know, our primary audience here is, is indigenous people. And then we also acknowledge, um, that we want to be able to translate these teachings yeah. for an, a non-native audience as well. So we, we almost thought about calling it something else, not calling it ceremony because that is kind of a cultural word. But then we thought, no, cause then we would be removing our, our, you know, we would be deprioritizing indigenous people if we did that. So, so we maintain that it's, you know, we call it ceremony, but within that circle of ceremony, that's going to look different for people from, you know, and there's a way to attack to, to connect to it in a, in a, in an approach, appropriate way um no matter who you are and where you come from for indigenous people like us yeah that might be sweat lodge or you know different ceremonies and modes of prayer that we have um for non-native uh folks you could be a religious person and perhaps your modality of prayer and and peacefulness and meditation is is a part of that ceremony circle you could be a, a completely um non-spiritual or non-religious person and there are practices such as uh, taking time in your day for silence. You know, we are overwhelmed in today's world with audible and, and visual noise, mostly coming from our phones. Uh, but it, you know, the, the over prevalence of technology in the workplace and every single thing that we do, we're really addicted to our screens. Um, so part of the ceremony circle is consciously taking time to, um, to remove ourselves from that noise. Uh, the 24-hour news cycle is another thing that really negatively impacts our mental health and even makes us more sedentary. And um, so within that ceremony circle, consciously taking time to remove ourselves from that, um, that toxic uh, wheel of news that we're constantly absorbed in. Um, the other thing with ceremony is, yeah, any type of contemplative practice. So uh, you don't have to make, you know, a big uh, scene out of it or, you know, make it, perf you don't have to make it all performative mm -hmm. and fancy, but literally mm -hmm. just lean back in your chair and close your eyes and just be silent for a little while, mm -hmm. you know, um, speak to ritual, to ritual. It. Yes. Ritual for anybody, um, you know, uh, sort of shifting things from, just like a mundane task that you do every single day to just inserting a little bit of intention in that. So whether it's like for me, um, you know, my skincare routine, it could be a time uh, that I just, you know, slather some stuff on you know, some screen and out the door because I have to, or I can like sit there for a minute, you know, in my head, say yeah. something nice to myself in the mirror and just take some time to take some deep breaths, you know, put on my skincare and, and try to make that a moment where I'm feeling better about myself or um, make that a moment where I say uh, some, some positive words of affirmation. Um, nighttime routines with the kids, you know, um, Friday evening, getting home from work and, you know, lighting a candle and reading a book and saying, this is what I do on Friday evenings. That can be a really powerful ritual for people. So any, any type of ritual, any type of contemplative practice, and finding time for silence, all of that fits within that circle of ceremony. And it's something that we really, really need in today's world. And I'd also say too that um, 
Yes, just to add to that, you know, I love all that what Chelsea has shared. And to add to that is that that ceremony is is the action of acknowledging your your spiritual reverence for all living things, for your life, for love, for health, for the sunlight, for the changing of the seasons, for mm -hmm. the four-legged, the winged, the finned nations, the small organisms, the 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 plant life that hold our work our world together. If you have reverence for those things, I would say that that that's a spiritual thing because these all of these things are connected by something, you know, by by energy of some sort. And and some people will say, oh, that's woo woo. And I always share with people, watch in in the in the future, technology is going to advance to be able to measure the connection between things. You know, if they if it's not if it, if it already isn't apparent to a lot of people. There's something that's making that that's in gravity. There's something that's 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 in the the bioelectricity of our brains and our hearts. There's a reason why you go walk into a room and if people are sad, you feel it. There's a reason because it's energy. You know, there's something there, and that's to me spirituality is again spirituality is not something that you do. It's just something you acknowledge because it's happening whether we have the eye or the moral view for it. It's happening. You know what I mean? And I think in dominant culture they people speak to certain parts of it. You know, people will say karma, which, you know, it comes from another culture. You know, people will say synchronicity, all those things in, in our worldview, that's spirit at work. And so I think ceremony is really, is just a action of acknowledging that mm -hmm. you're acknowledging that it could be something as easy as sitting up in the morning and taking breath and you're acknowledging air. I have, I'm grateful for this air I'm breathing because without air, all life would cease to exist. You can go on a fast, you know, for, I think a monk had fasted from food for like 300 something days. You can fast for water for several days, but you, you can't fast from air longer than I think the world record is like 18 minutes. Somebody was underwater without air. So that goes to show the reverence we should have for air. It's a, the basic necessity, but we take for granted because we don't have to think about it. I think, you know, ceremony is simply sitting in silence and shutting off the prefrontal cortex. And it's centering a lot of your energy and your heart and your feeling. What are you feeling right now? What do you what do you hear right now when you get out on the land? What do you smell? What do you taste? How does the air feel in your skin there? And take that breath in and you're you're silencing, you're resetting the brain, you know, and to be able mm -hmm. to um, take care of your daily tasks for the day. Mm -hmm. And a simple ceremony or ritual could be making a point to get up before the sun and to mm -hmm. sit in again in silence and open up the windows and let that sunlight come into your eyes. It could be the same in the evening time. It could be taking a conscious walk and looking at the sun as it goes down, taking in that evening light into your eyes there and helps prepare you, prepare your circadian rhythm and just giving thanks for the day. Cause that's the stuff that, you know, our, our recent relatives were doing very consistently in our communities. And my dad talks about that. Those are things that our people would do regularly in these pre-colonial times. And so that's something simple to me. I think all humans can do that. You know, all humans, because we all look and we see the sun, you know, we all look and, and, and notice it comes up. And if we take a moment to acknowledge those things and silence the mind there and abstain from any devices or technology or abstain from sharing it on social media and, and sit there and acknowledge those things and give thanks for what health you have right now, not thinking about our deficits. I think that that ceremony, ceremony is something we do individually. It's, cere it's ceremony is something that we do with family and we do collectively with other people of, of the same heart, same mind. It's something you do inside your office. It's something you do in your in your home or outside somewhere on the land. So that's what ceremony is. And ceremony, the result of ceremony should be expanding your worldview and understanding that your place in this beautiful interconnected web of life, mm -hmm. you are not at the center of it. You are a part of it. You're a part of this. And we walk in the world in a certain way. Ceremony should help foster that in the mind. Ceremony should, 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 should re uh, release a little bit of stress, anxiety. There should be a, a dopamine release. So there's a physiological component to what ceremony does, and it's been studied. The science shows it. So again, we're not talking about woo-woo. Indigenous life ways and ceremony were very practical. There's no like mysticism about it. Like I think that people need to demystify this concept of having ceremony. It's it's quite simple. And again, you could be an atheist and still do these things, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So oh, to yeah. me, I think that's what ceremony is. And I can encourage people to find what modes work for them to help, again, to relieve their stress and to 
once your stress is relieved, then our purpose, we are realized again, if the person, if the person hasn't already realized that there's their purpose for living and how they're going to do it might become more apparent. Mm -hmm. Or if you get off track in this crazy world, mm -hmm. you might be able to realign like, Oh, my goal once again, is this, my goal is to communicate this message and ceremony helps me to keep focus meditation or mindfulness, you know, or various forms of it. They help me to focus my vision and get back on the path and stay focused and not spread myself thin. Mm -hmm. That's what ceremony should, 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 it should, end results should be those things. Yeah. And I just want to share an example, like, you know, again, we, we're so ugh, like, we just don't, this performative spirituality that mm. we see on social media, like really gives me a pit in my stomach. Like it, it's, um, it's the saging and grounding. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's a bit much. And I think it, it actually doesn't help us as indigenous people to make people have more respect for our culture and our life ways, because you've got these, you know, new agers out there just like kind of making it all look silly. Um, but here's a, a nightly movement, what we call when, when the circles are interconnected, which they often are. Um, so here's an interconnection of movement, ceremony, and sleep that we've been doing in our family lately, which is um, we go outside um, right around the time the sun is starting to set. And that's when we do our nightly walk with our kids, throw them on the strollers or let them walk or ride their bike, whatever they want to do. Um, and we just walk around the blocks a few times here in our suburban neighborhood. And, um, we make sure that, you know, our eyes are outside when the sun is setting because we know about the scientific and the healing properties of being outside and observing the sunset. And we don't, you know, make it this big performance. We just do it. It's simple. And our kids enjoy it. We all get better sleep. We all get kind of in this state of being in a little bit better mood after this long, hectic day. And um, it was interesting. The other night, our our we must have said this out loud at some point a long time ago. I don't really remember. But our, our five-year-old, she goes, hey, mom. Because we said, hey, Al, what color is the sun? Oh, it's pink. You know, and she goes, hey, mom, the sun gives us medicine. I said, yep, you're right. And, um, so they pick up on it, you know, they pick up on it and they, mm -hmm. and she, she has respect, she has reverence for the sun. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's just one example yeah. of a very simple ceremony that anybody can do. And, and when we're doing these little walks, I encourage other people to, of course, abstain from your devices and encourage the children oh, yeah. to, what do you see? What colors do you see? That's why she asked, you know, what colors your sun? Cause we're, cause the sun in Arizona this time of year is like, you know, in the summertime, there's like lots of colors. So it looks pink to her, whatever purple, cause all the clouds and such. You know, so the girls, our daughters are real alert to what's happening. They're hyper aware of like how many birds are going on or if there's a dog near here or they're like a certain rock looks a certain thing. And that's because we intentionally train them to be like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's real critical for overall brain development, helps shape the worldview for, for children and for people too to kind of reset us and sort of reground us. Some people think regrounding is just standing in the barefoot grass or something. And I could do that too, but it's beyond just what your nervous system feels. It's what your nervous system senses and it's what, what your mind is acknowledging what's happening around you. And so um, that's one of the things that we like to do as well. And then when we get inside, we, we start to try to dim the lights because we don't want these like fluorescent lights blaring on us. And we're trying to get the girls prepared for bed. You know, sometimes they'll watch a little bit of something on their Kindle, but, you know, we try to minimize all that. And um, and then when we go down, when we lay down for with like, say, for my five year old, I'm the one that puts her to bed. She either wants a back scratch or she wants a, a, a cuddle and she wants me to talk to her. So and what she means by, you know, talk to me, dad, is because we do a giving of thanks. So we say we give thanks for the food we've eaten today, the plants and animals that give them their lives. We give thanks for so-and-so. We give thanks for our fire. We give thanks for air, shudag, water. We give thanks for the jibat gacham, our mother earth. We talk about all these things and she always falls asleep in it <laughs> and, and, and during it because it's comforting. So to us, that that's also a form of ceremony, and that's consistency, and that's where, like Chelsea said, to bring it back, what she said, that's how you, you your your circles of connection to land, family, and ceremony, you know, movement are all, you know, kind of blending, and they're all intersecting. Right. They're intersecting. They're happening at once. And movement is, you know, we're taking more steps. We're increasing our total daily energy expenditure. You know what I mean? Especially after a you know meal that might be higher in carbohydrates, we're allowing some glucose uptake by the movement. So 
improving insulin sensitivity, going to bed with the lower you know, glucose level to wake up with a healthy baseline. There's all these components that are going on. And I encourage everyone to think about that, not just zoom in and get caught up in one aspect. Sure, we need specialists, we need experts in these areas, but how do we get these experts together at the same, temple, uh, at the same table to formulate how we go forward as human beings, you know, for the best uh, overall health. Oh, that was just so lovely. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing that. That was yeah. really, I needed to hear that because I was feeling like, I don't know if I, but I do do things like that. Yeah, so I, yeah. yeah. Rituals that are repeated and that are sort of just, you know, a little bit of intention and, um, and that really makes an impact with our health overall. And, and it is something that that's often neglected um but that you know i think everybody in their mind they can think of a ceremony that they could or a ritual that they could pretty easily connect with and mm. and maintain and you're already doing elements of it and the more you understand it as the way we're sharing it the more it becomes a thing in your mind and then yeah. you put more emphasis on it it becomes a thing and mm. you're more emphasis then more emphasis that's why we wrote in the book mm. learn engage optimize so you're learning about it you're engaging with it, and over time, you learn to optimize it, and that's when you start start to experience the benefit. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing with me an hour of your time with with um, my listeners, and for writing this amazing, approachable, warm book that I think everybody needs to pick up, uh, especially if they're feeling just kind of irritated with uh, the latest new thing out there because this is like just a, a huge backwards step into real life Good. and and what it's all about so um just thank you so much yeah. for putting this out there into the world um do you guys ever do workshops can people can people see you in real life and also how can they find you on social media yeah so you can find us at well for culture um all spelled out which is um are we're most active on Instagram, I would say, of all the social media platforms. Um, Thosh is at thosh.collins. I'm at chelsea.moves, Chelsea with a Y. Um, and then um, for workshops and trainings, we're associated with a nonprofit organization called the Native Wellness Institute. So Native Wellness, um, you can Google them and you can reach out to us that way or just, you know, reach out to us at info at wellforculture.com. But yes, we do workshops, trainings, uh, speaking engagements, all kinds of stuff. And, um, and we love to connect with people in person. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm really happy to connect with you as well. And to, you know, to hear that our, our book has been, um, has been a, a good healing tool for you and easy to connect with that. That makes me really happy. So thanks for reading it. And thanks for having us here. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Dana. And we're just, we're honored to be, you know, on your podcast and to be, you know, brought into, to your community of people and, and, and to share all the similarities that we have. And, you know, we're, we're a part of that. We welcome others to, you know, be a part of the native community as well and find out how you support and learn as well. So thanks for your awesome work. Like Chelsea said, you know, it's, it's just great to have yours and people like yours and Rob's and many more's yeah. work to reference about, you know, the importance of, of understanding the truth, you know what I mean? The truth and, and, and the nuances and, and, and food, particular meat eating and the means of producing it. So thanks for your awesome work too. We're just, we're just look forward to continuing to see what more you're, you're bringing to the world. Yes. Thank you. All right. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. All right. You. Take care. Thanks so much for listening today and for following my work. If you believe in making sure people all over the world should have access to nutritious food, please join my mission through my nonprofit, the Global Food Justice Alliance. Visit sustainabledish.com backslash join and become a sustaining member today. All sustaining members get early access to ad-free podcasts plus free downloads, and you'll be helping get healthy protein like meat, fish, and eggs to food insecure kids. That's sustainabledish.com backslash join. And thank you.